Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. In this episode, we do part one of the Hebrews, Geography and Culture. The Hebrews are a Canaanite people on the move during the Bronze Age collapse. So what about, so they're one of these people, homeless, moving, uh, the Bronze Age class, as we discuss, is the end of uh, civilization. It's the apocalypse. All of these nomadic peoples are on the move. Lots of peoples are on the moves looking for new homelands. The Hebrews, or the people who will become the Hebrews, are one of these people. And we know this because of their story of the Exodus. Now, the Exodus is written in 500 or so BC, but the events took place somewhere between 1200 and 1000 BCE. And so, how do we talk about it? It's not history. It's not written at the time. It's not using sources of of the era. It's a so it's it's Cambridge archaeologist Scipion Broadbank described it as at best a refracted folk memory of earlier expulsions of Levantine people. It's a remembered event, like the Trojan War was for the Greeks. It's a morality event. And it's being written down 500 years later as a response to being enslaved in Babylon. So you can understand how the Exodus works, right? It's telling Hebrews, don't worry. We're slaves now, but we've been slaves before and we survived. And not only did we survive, we, with Yahweh's help, we, we got away and we thrived. We created a great kingdom. So don't worry. So the Exodus is not written to tell you about the Exodus. The Exodus is really being written to tell you about life in slavery in Babylon, which was historical. So where do the Hebrews end up settling? They settle in this tiny spit of land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. It's maybe 15 miles wide at some points. And it is east of Egypt and southwest of Babylon. What is the advantage of that? Well, it's far away from Egypt and from Babylon, meaning it has safety. It's on the other side of the desert from Egypt. And it is far up the coast and down the rivers from Babylon. That's safety. There's also that it's an arid land. There's not a lot of water there. In fact, there's the Dead Sea, a salt sea. You can't drink it. So it's an arid land with nothing really there, which means peace. Nobody is trying to conquer your land to take it from you because it's this great piece of property they, that they need it. So that's an advantage. The disadvantage is it's right in the middle of Egypt and Babylon. Oh, boy. The Battle of Megiddo, which is where we get Armageddon from, is the, the, the Armageddon is the battle of the end of the world between good and evil. Well, the Hebrews wrote about that after seeing an Egyptian Babylonian battle. And he said, this is what the end of the world has to look like. Well, if Egypt and, Bes and Babylon are going to fight each other, where are they going to fight each other? In the middle. That's Cana. So, being between the hammer and the anvil of Babylon and Egypt provides safety as long as the hammer and the anvil don't collide with you in the middle. There's also that Jerusalem is not a port. It's not connected to world trade. It's, it's got little trade. It's technologically and economically behind this is a thing that's going to throw off the Crusaders. The Crusaders are like going to get on boats in Italy and say, take us to Jerusalem. And the boats go, great, we'll take you there. And, or we'll take you as close as we can get. And they're like, well, as close as we can get should be Jerusalem, right? All the great cities in the world are ports. And the Italians like, yeah, okay. And then they drop them off in Libya, not Li in Phoenicia, excuse me, at Tripoli. This is why I was thinking... Libya, they dropped them off in Tripoli, the three the city that's named for three cities, 
in Phoenicia and say, okay, uh, see that road? Take that 250 miles south. Good luck with that. And the Crusaders like, wait a minute. I wanted to go to Jerusalem. And they're like, we're the closest port there is. And they're like, wait a minute. Jerusalem's not a port? And they're like, nope. It's in the middle of the desert, of this arid land. So it's not connected to these other civilizations. It's got little bits of trade. It's got, it's technologically and economically behind, but, and this is important, but it's got a homogeneous culture. The Canaanites who will become the Hebrews have a homogeneous culture. Now they've got the Philistines at Gaza to their South. They got the Phoenicians to their North dominating the coasts and dominating the ocean trade. So they're kind of sandwiched in between peoples, between smarter peoples to the north, the Phoenicians, and tougher people to the south, the Philistines. So what about Hebrew culture? Hebrew culture is Mesopotamian. It is, the writing system is Semitic, which is the writing system of the language system of the Mesopotamians. And it has Babylonian influences. And this is especially true, and it's very clear after the Babylonian captivity of 586. The Canaanites are a Mesopotamian people. In their law, in their temple design, in their language, they are Mesopotamian. Which makes sense. Egypt is isolated. It's on the other side of a desert. Right? The Canaanites are hanging out with Phoenicians and Mesopotamians and Hittites. Well, the Hittites are different people. But all of this mix of, of everything on the other side of the Sinai is Mesopotamian. They're, everyone's hanging out in Babylon. The Hebrews go to Babylon. We get the Tower of Babel story. We know they use the Code of Hammurabi. There's the flood story. There's a giant story of Noah. That's Gilgamesh. Right? So we see these influences in, in Hebrew culture. But, number two, there is a tight political alliance with Egypt. Why? The Egyptian pharaoh is right on the other side of the, the desert. He's closer. The new kingdom pharaohs owned Cana. And if not owned it, were allied to the kings in Cana the pre-Hebrew kings. And the Hebrews were not yet Hebrews when they were just a regular Canaanite people who was separating themselves out. So you keep those friends. Babylon is too far away. The Egyptian king is right next door. All right, there's a desert. He'll have to cross the desert to come and help you. But he's closer than Babylon. So even though they're culturally Mesopotamian, politically, they're more allied to Egypt. Egypt is the bigger power who is closer nearby. This is true even today. Who was the first Arab power Israel, modern Israel made an alliance with, or at least a peace treaty with? Egypt. Why? Because it's right on its border and there's a lot of people in Egypt. You have to have peace with the Egyptian pharaoh. If you're going to have any security in Israel, Judah, Palestine, Israel, in Cana. Okay, well, so far we've got a Mesopotamian people with a tight alliance with Egypt. What's making the Hebrews the Hebrews? Number three, they begin to do things culturally that separate themselves out from other Canaanite peoples. And these are all famous things. The first is diet, especially no pigs. Why no pigs? Now, I always will get students who say, it's a dirty animal. And then they go home and have Christmas ham. I go, no, it's not a dirty animal. That's an excuse. It's a religious, it's a religious excuse. Why? Because bacon is delicious. So you have to give people a reason other than just don't do it. But the real reason is, the pig was the first domesticated animal for food. So everybody else ate pig. This is why Italians are going to eat pig. This is why St. Um, Paul, this is why Paul, when he goes and tries to convert the Romans, 
uh, to Christianity, uh, or to, well, Christianity, which was still like Jews for Jesus at this point. And the Romans say, okay, great, Jesus is awesome. What else do we have to do? And he's like, no bacon. And the Romans laugh at him. And say, ha, 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 ha. We're Roman. And it's Paul who'll say, okay, 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 forget that stuff. That's just Jewish stuff. You could have as much pig as you want. Sausage, pork chops, bacon. And they're like, that's what we were thinking. So our Easter and our Christmas dinner is going to be ham. It's going to be a giant pork. If it was dirty, why would all of the world eat pigs? Right? Why would you eat it today? Why would it be delicious? It's not. But it, you need a reason. And the reason is everyone else is eating pigs. We don't want to be like everybody else. So we're going to give it up. It's like vegans today saying, I want to live a healthier lifestyle. I want to be different. I want to show I am morally superior and I'm not like everybody else. Everybody else eats lots of meat in America, especially in America. So I'm not, I am not going to eat meat. It's a way of separating oneself out to keep oneself separate. Because if you're acting just like everybody else, why would you survive as a people? You're not, the Hebrews aren't the only Canaanite people. And then there's the Phoenicians. And then there's the Babylonians. Like, you need a reason to be you. So you need to separate yourself out. And not eating pig was one. Two, male circumcision. Now, for those of you who don't know, when boys are born, they have a penis. And on their penis is a wrapper. And what the Hebrews do is cut that wrapper off. They cut the bippy off the bippy and they sacrifice it. Why does this matter? Well, one, nobody else is taking a sharp knife, much less a sharp stone, and cutting the bippy off their son's bippies. Right? And so... That's kind of crazy. Like everybody looks at that and goes, that's crazy. You know, want to know how crazy that is? It's so crazy that in the Second World War in the 1940s, the Nazis, the SS, when they wanted to make sure you were Jewish and not just, you know, a Jew pretending to be an Aryan Christian, they go, drop your pants. And the guy went, oh man. Because he knew he was circumcised. And the moment he dropped his pants... The Germans, the German Aryan Christians, were not circumcised. And they knew it was a thing that was going to separate himself out. Now, here's the thing. Americans and Brits, for the most part, and the Anglo world is circumcised. So even though we're not Jewish as a people, the American people, most American men are circumcised. Almost 100% of American white men are circumcised. Something like 80% of African-American men are circumcised. And Hispanic men, it really kind of depends on when your family got here. If you are a uh, Texan, American, Hispanic, you've been here 400 years, you're probably circumcised. If you're a new immigrant from, say, Nicaragua, you are very likely not circumcised. This goes for Spanish immigrants as well from Europe. Um... And this has to do with hygiene. Uh, the Victorians became very hygienic, obsessed with hygiene in the late 1900s, uh, late 1800s. And so uh, Americans picked that up. And so it's a hygiene thing. So basically, if you're born after 1950, as an American man, you and you're, you're the, at least the second generation of American, you're circumcised. You are missing. There is, when you look at yourself, there's a bit of you missing. It's not an important part. There's arguments about this. But the idea of male circumcision was it wasn't animal or child sacrifice. The God of the Hebrews just needs the bippy on your bippy. He doesn't need you to murder your child like Moloch does, the Phoenician God. And he doesn't need all of the animal sacrifices that the, that the uh, polytheistic gods demand when we talked about them. Now, here's the thing. This is how you know the Hebrews are also Mesopotamian. What will Israelites and Judeans do in the temple? Animal sacrifice. Even though they're not technically supposed to, 
they still do it. Abraham will sacrifice a ram, and that will justify animal sacrifice. But the idea is the male circumcision was the only sacrifice you really needed to do, and it is a sacrifice since you're cutting the bippy off your bippy. But the big thing that separates the Canaanite peoples, the Hebrews out from all other Canaanite peoples and everybody else is religion. And what they do is transform from a polytheistic people where many gods control nature and territories. See Abraham. When Abraham is born, he's a polytheist. He will become not quite monotheist because he will become monolatry. Monolatry is where you have one God. You've got the right God, but other gods do exist. This is Moses. These are the non-prophets and the kings and the chronicles. Uh, in a way, this is Abraham. Abraham's the first one of these. And the idea is we got the right God, but the Egyptian gods exist. The Babylonian gods exist for them. How do you know about monolatry? Well, because Moses tells you in the first of the Ten Commandments, which is not the first commandment, by the way. The first commandment is given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And there are 611 commandments. But of Moses' ten the first one is, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shall have no other gods before me or other than me, depending on your translation. Why do you have to say that? Why do you have to tell people they don't need other gods? Now, when I was a kid, they were like, oh, they meant like money. No, they didn't. They meant literally other gods because there were other gods out there. And you had to remind people, no, 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 no. Keep your eye on the prize. I'm the one. There are other gods out there. Islam gets this shit right. Why? Because its first tenet is there is one God, Allah, and Muhammad is the prophet. Now, the Muhammad is the prophet is the Jesus, Jesus uh, asterisk. Why? Because Christians got the mon monotheism part right. There is one God. And then they took Jesus and made him into a God. They made him the son of God. They made him literally God, the avatar of God on earth. And for Islam and for Judaism, that's a mess up. That's that's making multiple gods. The Trinity is, you know, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. And everyone else goes, that's three gods. One, two, three. And the Christians went, no, it's a complicated thing where it's three, but it's really one. And it's like rush and you it's it's Greek. You just wouldn't understand. So. It's a mess. But monolatry is we there. We've got the right God and everyone else can worship their loser gods, but we've got the right one. But then eventually will come the monotheism. After about 500 years, it is a long process to go from polytheism to monotheism. And it's about 500 years of involving military defeat and prophets. The prophets are going to be huge in promoting monotheism and promoting that change from monolatry to monotheism. Now, monotheism is there is one God. Every, all the other gods are fake. They don't exist. They're figments of people's imaginations which is a bit insulting to other people, but it's a way of stopping your own people from worshiping other gods when the shit hits the fan. And we're going to talk about the shit hitting the fan a lot in this, in especially in the next lecture. But monotheism is there is one God and we, he's our God. He's we're his people and he's our God. Now you can already see I've made a mistake. Because I have referred in a very traditional way to this God as a he. Now, that's wrong. Why? Because what monotheism does is transform the divinity, the God, from human to transcendental. Polytheistic gods are human. Monotheistic God is transcendental, has no body, is not bound by the laws of existence. So I use he because I am an, well, I'm not old. But I am been brought up in a world where you always refer to God as a he. 
but it's not a he. This God is whatever this God wants to be. This God is not bound by gender. This God is not bound by form. This God not, is not bound by physics. This God can be a dog, a puppy, a woman, a man, whatever this God wants to be. That's the first thing you have to understand. Now, I will... F- tr- I will... Tr- I don't know what to say because I don't like he because that's so patriarchal, but it is kind of weird to say we could use they, which is as a Catholic, not technically wrong since it's they and it's the three. So I'm not technically wrong there. So maybe I will go with they Um, because they is both plural and now singular and the AP style guide says it's singular so we can use it. But this transcendental God is not human in any way, shape, or form. It may take the form of human, but in its being, it is not. And that makes this God better than people. And that's important. And it's because it's better than people, it's better than other gods. It's more moral. Does this God have sex? No. Does this God do drugs? No. Do the Greek gods? Yeah, a lot. This God is also more powerful omnipotent, all-powerful, and more knowledgeable, omniscient than all other gods, than all other people. This God knows everything that was, is, and will be. More powerful? The you know, I went to Catholic school, and so there you had a joke with the with the professors, with the with the brothers, and we're like, hey, and actually this comes right out of um George Carlin. George Carlin has a skit that's it. It could have been in my class, in my high school class. Hey, father. Hey, father. Is God so powerful he can make a rock even he can't pick up? <laughs> and then you want to blow, you want to blow your freaking mind. The answer to that is yes. God is so powerful. God can make a rock even God can't pick up. And then you know what God does picks it up and walks away because God is also that powerful. And you're like, but they're different. No, no, no. God can make a rock and go, wow, that's so big. Even I can't pick that up. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just pick it up and walked away. Boom. Mic drop. That's right. What is the advantage of monotheism? It's legitimacy. Why? Because we are the chosen people. The the Hebrew, the Hebrews, think about who the Hebrews are. The Hebrews are a small people who are part of the Canaanites, who are a small people, who are wedged between the Phoenicians, the Philistines, who are wedged between the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, who are wedged between the Hittites, the Indians, and whatever's going on in crazy ass Europe at this point. They're nobody. They're insignificant. And yet, what can they say? We have the chosen God. We have the right God, and he chose us. We are the chosen people. We are special, despite all evidence to the contrary. Are we as rich as Egypt? No, and nobody says they are. Are we as smart and as advanced as Babylon? Hell no. That's the Tower of Babel story. The Tower of Babel story is all these Hebrews coming back from Babylon and people be like, what's Babylon like? And they're like, they build buildings so big they knock on God's front door. Why is that important? It's important because nothing in Jerusalem is that big and nothing in the small towns around Jerusalem is as close to as big as Jerusalem. And so their minds just go. They don't have a great empire. They don't have wealth. They don't have pyramids. You know how, how you don't, they don't have buildings above two stories. And then they go to Egypt and they see the pyramids. And the Egyptians are like, yeah, we built that 2,000 years ago. And the Hebrews are like, we don't even know who we are 2,000 years ago. Like, like we don't know. Like, that's crazy. And so what monotheism does is make you special. This God cares for you. And that is its great advantage. 
I have gone to many a Catholic church in many a language. I've gone to, I have hung out with, with born again Christians. And what do they all believe? I have hung out with Jews and Muslims. And what do they all believe? That they are special because their God, who they believe in with all of their heart, loves them. And that makes them special. The master of the universe, the creator of all life, cares about them that is the great fight evolution is not the great fight with darwin like the catholic church has said darwin was right back in the 18 like 90s i mean it's science it's a process the big fight that christianity has with darwin is the idea that we're not special that we're just an animal trying to survive and that was something Darwin was worried about, too. He didn't like where his research was going. That we were ordinary. Now, I'm spending a little bit of time on this part because you have to asterisk it. You have to highlight it. You should underline it. Because this is what's going to allow the Hebrews to survive. This legitimacy of a small, poor people is going to allow the Hebrews to survive the devastation of the Assyrian invasion, the slavery of the Babylonians, the reconquest of the Greeks, and then the obliteration of the Romans, destroying Jerusalem a second time, the pogroms in Europe, the genocide in Germany, and then finally, the Holocaust. That legitimacy will allow these people to survive when nobody else from the ancient world of this period survives they're gone they're all gone the sumerians the akkadians even the ancient egyptians they're egyptians yes but they're not the same the hittites are gone they're all gone the phoenicians the other canaanites the hebrews are different they have evolved they are not the same people as 500 bce the religion is not the same but they are the same they are the same people they have survived they're the same culture and that is incredibly strong important advantage because you cannot do anything in Jewish studies without understanding that advantage, the advantage of monotheism, especially in a world of polytheism. Because remember, everybody looks at them and says, you're crazy. Of course, there are multiple gods. And the second advantage is what we've talked about is this emotional connection with Yahweh. Now, Yahweh is the name we're going to give this God. Yahweh, if you're a Christian, it's Jehovah. If you're a Muslim, it's Allah. And Jehovah means Yahweh, by the way. It's a Latinization. It's the Romanization of Yahweh. Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah. They're all the same God. The understanding of that God is different. And so the human relationship with that God is slightly different. But that God is the same being. So if you ever go to the great party in the sky and run into somebody with a name tag that says, Hello, my name is Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah, that's God. That's God, big G. That's the name. I am who am. I am the one and only. I am who made this, you know, all the different translations. Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah. Monotheistic God loves us. The polytheistic gods don't. And you just have to look at Moloch who eats babies or the flood in, in, in Mesopotamia to know that the polytheistic gods, they want sacrifice, but they don't care about their people. Yahweh cares. There are several disadvantages. First is Yahweh is unknowable. You can't know what this God wants. You can't know what this God demands, likes, dislikes. Unlike polytheistic gods who are knowable because they're human, this God is unknowable. You cannot figure out their plans. 
And this God cannot be negotiated with. Now, we in our heart of hearts are still polytheists. We try. If you've ever gotten on your knees and said, dear God, if you help me, I promise. If you just get me out of this situation, I promise I'll never do it again. That's what you do for polytheism. Because that's a contract. That's a, I will do something if you do something. This God doesn't care about that. In fact, this God gets mad. And that's a problem. Because there are no other gods to appeal to. See Jeremiah 15. I'll go down to 6. 15, 6. Thou hast forsaken me, saith the Lord. Thou hast gone backward. Therefore, I will stretch out my hand against thee. I'm going to give you a smack. And destroy thee. I am weary with repenting of you people constantly saying you're sorry. I'm not negotiating anymore. And I will fan them with a fan in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. Ah. <sighs> How would you feel about being Jeremiah telling people this? How would you be feel about hearing it? When this God gets mad, you have problems because in polytheism, another God can bail you out. Odysseus has a problem with Poseidon, but Athena loves him. And so we'll help him bail him out of problems. If Yahweh is mad at you, there is no help. This brings about a problem. Jeremiah brings about the third problem. Who speaks for Yahweh? And this creates a conflict in society, a problem with legitimacy. Is it the prophets? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Isaiah, John. Is it the prophets or the priests? Who are the professionals? The prophets are amateurs. The prophets deal with revelation. They go out into the desert for three or 30 days and they come out and go, I spoke to God. They're amateurs. They're, they, they are not professionals. They don't hang out in the temple. They don't go to school. They don't get a degree in Yahweh. They're also individuals. We know them by their names. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Isaiah, John the Baptist. We know them as individuals. Meanwhile, the priests are the priests. Right? But they're the professionals. They study. They get degrees. They're the traditional group you go to. They're supposed to know. But in a society with one God, who speaks to that God? That God can speak to anybody. So who speaks for that God? And this is constantly, and you see this throughout. This is Jesus's fight. Jesus's fight is he is a prophet. He is a traditional Hebrew prophet. He fits right into the traditional Hebrew prophetic tradition. And who is his fight with? Not the Romans. His fight is with the priests who are like, that's not what the rules say. That's not what the rules say. That's not what the rules say. And what does Jesus do? Challenge the meaning of the rules. He goes, yes, it says, don't do work on the Sabbath, but I'm healing the sick. How can be doing a good thing be bad just because of what day it's on? And the priests go back to their books and say, well, we have studied this and we have written about it and we will tell you why. Hold on. And Jesus is like, that doesn't make any sense. You're missing the point. His fight is with the priests. And so that's this conflict in society. Who really speaks for Yahweh? And there's always this problem of legitimacy. Because the priests are traditional, but they're boring. They're a group. They're educated. They're, they're studied. They're solid. But the prophets are sexy. We have prophets today. 
We have people who claim to be Jesus or the new Jesus or related to Jesus or God. Why aren't you following them? Why do you go just to your minister or to your priest? Because they're traditional. They are not in the Texas desert, wandering around eating beets or living in a van. Like some of these guys, but some of these guys will have people who follow them. Right? 15, 20, 50 people, 100 people who are like, you are a prophet. And do you see how that's always a problem for legitimacy? It's always a problem for um, maintaining um, authority. Now, we, you, we, you should notice, Jesus is a prophet. The prophetic tradition won. The priesthood got crushed, especially once the Romans obliterated Jerusalem in the second temple. The priesthoods got disbanded, humiliated. That's important because it, it, it influences how we think. We think if you're a good Christian or a Catholic, you think Jesus was right, which means you think John the Baptist was right, which means you read a Bible that was written by people who thought those two guys were right, which means when they put together the Old Testament, they put together things in it that emphasized that the prophets were right. I just read you Jeremiah 15 about how God was going to, Yahweh was going to obliterate the people of Judah. Why? Why is he, Jeremiah, in the Old Testament? Because Judah got obliterated by the Babylonians. So people look back and go, ha ha, Isaiah's in it because he keeps talking about how the son of man will show up, how a great prophet will show up, how God will come to earth. And one day, one day, one day, well, the early Christians said, that Jesus, that's our one day. There's lots of Jewish stuff that isn't in the Old Testament that the Christians left out. Lots of stuff, especially the commentaries. That's not, your Bible is created. The Christian Bible is, is a book created to tell a certain story. It's not literal. It's not history. It's, it's just not. I'm sorry. It's just not. The stuff that happened in it did not word for word happen. There's two creation stories, right? The Bible in the first few pages tells you. What's the two creation stories? The world was created in seven days. Boom, 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 right? Animals, then people together. Flip a page. There's a second creation story where man is created first and then the animals and then woman. If the Bible is literal, meaning everything in it is true, how can both of those stories be true? So the, 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 the stories were already right from the first pages telling you it's about the morality tale. It's about the lesson you get out of this. This is not an easy book. It contradicts itself. It is not literal. It is inspired because those two stories tell you two different things about Yahweh. That's their purpose. They tell you about the relations between men and women. They tell you about the relations between humans and animals. They were never meant to be literal. This is the way it happened. So you have to understand that when you're reading your Bible, you're coming out. People who put it together in the 300s AD were looking for stuff to prove they were right about Jesus. And a lot of the stuff that was written itself was written in 500 BC about events from 1000 BC. So it's a freaking mess, which is why the Catholic Church didn't let people read it. Because they're like, it's too complicated for people. Because you can find anything in the Bible to prove you're right. Anything. It's all in there. The whole spectrum of human existence is in your Bible. The other problem that monotheism have is Job, the story of Job. 
which is why do bad things happen to good people? Now, why is this a problem? Polytheism doesn't have to explain why bad things happen to good people. You have evil gods. You have gods who don't care about you. You have selfish gods. You have pernicious gods. You have mean gods. But Yahweh loves you. So wait a minute. Why did your children die? Why did you lose your farm? Why did you get cancer? Why did bad things happen to you if you're good? This is a problem that monotheism has to deal with. And the answer is you don't really get to know. It's God's will. For Christians, it's God's plan. It just is. And that's what the story of Job is dealing with. Why does this happen? And I love the story of Job. And I am also in a minority in my reading of the story of Job. I don't think Job ever gives in. I think he's sarcastic at the end. When Job says, when, when, so, okay, briefly. The story of Job is probably older. It's probably one of the oldest stories in the Bible. It's probably a Mesopotamian story, to be honest. Like, like, like Noah, that the Hebrews took from another, from another culture and adapted And what it starts with is Yahweh saying to Satan, who's not yet evil at this time, because they're hanging out together, who's not yet the fallen angel, but says to Satan, look at Job, he does everything right. He is a good guy. He is a perfect dude. He follows all the rules. And that is incredibly important because it tells you Job is right later on. So two, Satan says, well, of course he loves you. You give him everything. Take it away from him. And Yahweh says, okay, I'll make a deal. I'll make a bet with you, Satan. Do it. You can't kill him, though. And so what does Satan do? Satan kills his kids. Satan destroys his business. Satan does all kinds of, destroys all of his stuff, right? And Job is like, nope. Job's wife is like, blame God. And Job is like, nope. Nope, this is God's plan. This is God's plan. I'm cool with it. It sucks, but I'm okay with it. He gaveth, he will taketh away. It's actually not mine. It's God's. So Job is kicking ass. And God and Yahweh is like, yeah. See, look at him. Told you, Satan. Satan's like, well, let me do some stuff to his body. And Yahweh says, great. Can't kill him. Satan's like, no problem. So he gives him cancer. He makes sores grow. You know, all kinds of terrible things happen to him. And Job doesn't deny God, but it says, why is this happening to me? I just would like to know. And then three dudes come up, his friends, and they're like, you know, Job, you must have done something wrong. And he says, no, no, I didn't do anything wrong. I know I didn't do anything wrong. I followed the rules the way the rules were supposed to be followed. I'm a good person and I just want to know. I want God to tell me why did bad things happen to me? And the, the three dudes are like, see, you won't admit that you were wrong. So see, you got pride. And he's like, but I didn't do anything wrong. And it's not prideful to admit I didn't do anything wrong when I didn't do anything wrong. So your argument is facetious. It's kind of dumb. It, it's circular. And the three guys are like, yeah, but I got, but you know, later on people will blame you. So we're going to win. And Job's like, well, that sucks. God should tell me why I did wrong. And right then, Yahweh appears. As the whirlwind, as a tornado, as a hurricane, boom, as power, raw freaking power. And from the whirlwind, Yahweh speaks out, who are you? to ask me questions. And Yahweh then proceeds to give the longest speech Yahweh gives in the Hebrew Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew stories. It's like 144 lines where what does he do? He recounts 
all the cool, powerful stuff God has done. And it's basically power. I, I'm sorry, and you have probably have parents, and you've certainly had bosses who have done this, maybe even teachers, and where Yahweh goes, I'm sorry, I didn't know I had to ask your permission. Where were you when I created the universe? I separated the earth from the sea. I made mountains. Where were you to criticize me then? I'm sorry. I didn't realize I owed you an explanation about the way things are. If you've ever watched A Few Good Men, this is the colonel's speech at the end. You can't handle the truth. That's God to to Job. You can't handle it. I have done what I do, and it's not only nice, it's not always great, and it's not always fair, but I do it because I have to. The three guys have wet themselves, and Job is sitting there going, Okay, I see. I understand. I see you now. I asked for you to explain to me. Basically, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is this happening to me? And now I see. See, I, I'm of the minority opinion. I, I am of the opinion that Job is asking for justice. I just want to know why these bad things are happening. Just tell me why. If, it's, if I did it, I, if it's a punishment, I deserve it. I will accept my punishment. I just want to know why. He is asking for justice. But the problem is, is he's caught Yahweh. He's caught Yahweh because Yahweh isn't just. He made a deal with Satan. Now, there are people who are even more of a minority opinion than I who are like, ah, Satan is smarter than God. I'm not going that far. God's okay with it. God knows how this is going to work out. But he also knows he got caught. He was hoping that by showing Job all of his power, that like his three friends, Job would go, I'm with you. I got it. And you can read. There is a reading. It has been inserted. It is there that you could read it straight. What Job says. And Job says, I asked about things I didn't know. I have now seen things I hadn't seen before. And now who am I to ask you? Any more questions? And you could read that the way most people read it is Job gives in. But I have spent 25 years teaching teenagers, teaching 20 year olds, and I know sarcasm when I see it. And I see Job unbent, unbowed, going, I thought you were a God of justice. And I see that you're not. You're not that much better than the other gods, are you? So do what you want. I believe in you. I am not turning my back on you. But you're also not what you're advertised as. So I won't say anything more. I will close my mouth. I will shut my ears. Because I've seen all I need to see. That's Job. That's Job at the end. And what does Yahweh do? Yahweh rewards Job, gives him seven or 10 times what he had before, right? He buys Job off. He punishes the three guys. He turns to those three guys and are like, who are you to accuse Job of doing something wrong? And they're like, but, but, but you punished him. You, he had to have done something wrong. And he went, no, Job didn't do anything wrong. And then he punishes those guys for thinking, think about what he punished them for. Those three guys thought God was just. That God had a reason to punish Job. And they got punished. Because they didn't believe in Job. And then, in the Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew stories, in the Hebrew Testament, God goes away and never comes back. They are the final words God says in the Hebrew Testaments. Now think about that because the old, the Hebrew stories, the Hebrew 
tales, the Hebrew Bibles, the Hebrew books, are the story of God's relationship with people. And Job is the last time this character says words in his own story. And that is an issue. The silence of God is an issue in monotheism. Angels in America, the play, Tony Kushner's play, has a scene where the angel talks about that God has gone away, bored with his angels, upset with his people, his humans. He has left us. He has taken a vacation and he has not returned. And you have, if it is all about faith. Because I have been there, and I'm sure you have been there. Why doesn't God answer my prayers? And some older, smarter person goes, maybe he did. You just don't know it. You just can't see it because your ways are not God's ways. And I'm like, F that, man. He talked to Moses. He came down. He sat down with Moses. Now, Moses is one of the few people he ever saw what God looks like in all of God's glory. And Moses got old. Moses came away. These are people who have read the Odyssey because they came. he came away gray, old. One does not see God as God and come away the same. So. We've been asking that question. Why? Where is God? So that's the problem with Job. Why? Well, because what does Yahweh control? Everything. What does Yahweh care about? Everything. So what does Yahweh make rules about? everything there are 613 commandments i may have said 611 before because i always leave out the two that were that that i always leave out two and i don't know what two they are but i always I, there was a book i read that had 611 i think i remember it as 611 but i i for this lecture i looked it up and it says 613 but it means what are the rules about everything there are rules about hair and they're contradictory rules they're cut your hair they're don't cut your hair there are 40 rules about sex how you do it when you do it what positions you do it in who you do it with there are 40 rules plus about food what you eat what you don't eat when you eat it when you don't eat it how you cook it there are rules about debt there's rules about credit there's rules about your slaves there's rules about your wives and there's rules about not changing the rules because god doesn't mess up when god made the rules those were the rules but that's a problem why one you're punished for everything two there's rules about everything but three society changes over time but the rules don't this is the problem when people say the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. Yeah. And the and the story was written in 500 BCE. When for those people, homosexuality was wrong. No, it wasn't wrong for the Spartans. It wasn't wrong for the Thebans. Completely. But it was for them. And there's a scene in, in the first season episode of The West Wing when the character Toby goes to his rabbi about a um, capital punishment crime, and they have they have a religious discussion, and Toby, who is a secular Jew, talks to his rabbi. I mean, he goes to synagogue, but he's a reformist secular Jew, and he says the Torah doesn't pro prohibit capital punishment. It says an eye for an eye, and the rabbi goes. You know what else it says? It says a rebellious child can be brought to the city gates and stoned to death. It says homosexuality is an abomination and punishable by death. It says men can be polygamous and slavery is acceptable. For all I know, that thinking reflected the best wisdom of its time. But it's just plain wrong by any modern standard. Society has a right to protect itself, but it doesn't have a right to be vengeful. It has a right to punish, 
it doesn't have a right to kill. What the rabbi is saying is society has changed. But if you open up your Old Testament, it's the same words from 2,500 years ago. And so people will say, it says it in the Bible, homosexuality is wrong. And I, my response is, did you read the other paragraphs around it? Because it says you could cut out the tongue of a, of a rebellious child. It says you could sell your daughter into prostitution if she doesn't obey you. It says men cannot be in the same room with a menstruating woman. And since you can't know if a woman is menstruating, it means you cannot be in the room with a woman. Modern business can't work. Modern schools can't work. If you follow that rule. So why is it, oh, the homosexuality part, that's real. But we ignore all the other parts of Leviticus, of Deuteronomy. Why? It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has to do with you. You don't like homosexuals. And that's fine. I mean, I don't think it's fine, but I, that's your opinion. And I can debate you on your opinion, but don't tell me God said so. Because God said a whole lot of other things you don't like were wrong. That you do. You eat pork. It's right there. You eat shrimp. You eat lobster. You're not supposed to eat any of that stuff. Yet you do. Do you cut your hair? It says not to cut your hair. Do you not cut your hair? It says not to cut your hair. So what this means, and this is important because this is a problem, is that there's always a reason for God to be mad at people because you can't follow all 16, 613 commandments. There was a book about a decade ago or so called um, um, My Biblical Life or My Year, My Year of Living Biblically. I went to um, the Jewish Community Center in Cherry Hill to, to see the author speak. And it was, it was an excellent speak. And the first things he goes is, I try to do all 611 commandments. You can't do them. You can't do them all together. They, they, they weren't written at the same time. They weren't written for the same people. And so they contradict each other. So you can't do them. And you don't want to do them like, oh, you're supposed to stone an adulterer. Um, yeah, that's freaking barbaric. Your friend says, hey, dude, you know, I'm cheating on my girlfriend. You don't take a giant rock and hit him in the head. And people didn't want to do it at the time. That's the Jesus story, right? You without sin cast the first stone. And then all the men dropped the rocks. Now it gets more complicated because the first person who's supposed to throw the rock is the husband. The one who's been wronged. It's like, you know, some stranger can't throw a rock. It's got to be the husband. The husband has to want to punish his wife. And he doesn't. So he drops the stone and he walks off. And all the men follow him. But that's the idea. People didn't want to want to do that then. Remember when I talked about the law of Hammurabi and people didn't want to punish women the same way they punish men? That's the same. We're seeing that in the New Testament. And so, but it also means we're always breaking the rules. So for conservatives, for literalists, they look at society as always falling apart. It's always, we have to make monotheism, we have to make God great again because we're always fallen we're always sinning because just by living in a society that is not in the year 500 BCE, we can't be following these rules. And so monotheism has this problem of how do you change the rules? How do you update them? How? And we're still dealing with this. Still. So... Those are the advantages. Those are the disadvantages. I know this is a long lecture, but remember, class is 75 minutes long and we're coming in at around an hour. Um, and so be safe. Take care. Thank you. This is a heavy duty philosophical thing, but this is the world we're living in. We're mono, we're, we live in a monotheistic world and we have to talk about that. And this is the one time we're going to spend 
really digging into how you interact with Yahweh or Allah or Jehovah. Be safe out there.